Uh, welcome everybody. Hey, thanks for, for joining in. Uh, I've been working towards this for quite some time. Uh, as some of you know, I, 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 I love to teach, love to share my knowledge, and this pandemic sort of forced me to go uh, virtual. So I have been teaching uh, across the, the state at local lubricant clubs and also every Monday morning to uh, 17 countries and four continents uh, through the Chippendale School of Furniture, which is kind of cool. We're going to get going here, and I'm going to let Nancy take over just in a bit. But uh, what I wanted to do is, uh, for this first class, just to give a general overview of, of, of veneering. And basically, we're going to give a couple short stories on how I got inspired, and um, then I'll show you actually how veneer is made, which is really cool if you've never seen that. Uh, a very, very brief his history and explaining the bad rap that veneer did get. And then I'm going to show you a whole variety of things of what veneer can do. And my intention here is to, you know, inspire you or, or show you some techniques or processes or applications that you may not be aware of. So, in any event, I'm broadcasting from the uh, Finger Lakes Hills of Western New York. Nancy and I live up there on a little slice of heaven on top of the, on top of the mountain. And yes, that is a 16 foot chair in her backyard. Um, and my shop is on the right hand side there. So as I mentioned, this is Nancy. <clears throat> Couldn't have done this without her, so thank you, Nancy. And um, she's gonna do some housekeeping here just to make sure everybody's on board if this is your first time on Zoom. Uh, so take it away, Nancy. So thank you everyone for coming. We're very excited about this fabulous um, veneer class um, with the fabulous Skunk Row. So if you haven't used Zoom before or if you are familiar, um, if you, Take your, your mouse and hover along the bottom of your screen, and I'm gonna be admitting people as we go along, you'll see a chat window. If you do not see a chat window, then uh, there's three dots that say more. You can open that up and open the chats, right? So it's going to be easy for us. If you wanna ask questions, you can chat in the chat area. You can ask your question there and I'll interrupt Scott. Sometimes it's not very easy to do. Um, so I can interrupt him and ask questions as we go along with the class. If you'd like to, um, another way of making sure you're getting your questions going to be answered is there's a little uh, hands up button. So just click the hands up button and that'll put you to the top um, just so we can make sure that, we'll, that we can see your question. Um, what else is there? I think that's it. You, um, we're uh, we're going to ask you to mute all. We are experiencing some latency in his speech and sound. So if it can be helpful if you turn your own video off because we won't need to see you as much as we would like to. Um, it could help with, uh, with the quality of the video that you're experiencing. So we're gonna ask for everyone to keep muted. And then during the Q&A, if you have questions, you're welcome to unmute them or you can uh, chat with me and I can ask the questions too but it's a free flowing conversation that uh, we're gonna be learning and going through and it's, we're very excited. So did I miss anything, Scott? No, I think you're great. Isn't she great? Give her a big hand, folks. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> uh, also, uh, by the way, Nancy uh, was my childhood sweetheart. We went to high school together and um, boy, talk about stress when you're trying to do her face in marketry. You know, that was stressful. And the handstands, you know, what that's all about. If you follow me on social media, uh, we are on the gymnastics team together and we do handstands all around the world and post them. So that's kind of fun. People want to know what that's all about. Okay, so uh, just again, this is sort of what my setup is. That's actually basic. I got a much more advanced setup. We got a number of cameras, green screen, and that's um, sort of what that looks like if you're interested in that. Okay, so um, brief history on how I uh, got turned on by Veneer. Wendell Castle, if you don't know him, he is a, a world-renowned uh, woodworker. Uh, does, uh, he's sort of the grandfather of art furniture, so crazy, sculptural. It may not be your thing, but you gotta appreciate his craftsmanship. In fact, the image on the left is his ghost clock. He was asked to make a, you know, enter a piece into a clock show so he did this grandfather clock with the sheet over it. And that sheet is actually carved wood. So it's not even a working clock. And there's a rope tied around there. And he did all the stitching and everything. And just to kind of show you what his, um, what his thought process is. 
And in the 60s, he was known for sort of trumploid carving. So the one on the uh, right hand side on the bottom is sort of a chair with a with a, a solid jacket hanging on it. But um, I just interrupt and say that the ghost clock is at the Smithsonian in yeah. Washington, D.C. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the top center, if you, in fact, are interested in seeing one of the most amazing shops you've ever seen on my YouTube channel, Imagine Grove, I have a, a shop tour. It's, it's actually one of my very first interviews that I did a few years back. And um, boy, it's a, a really, really cool shop if you ever want to see what, what that kind of level it, uh, is. But in any event, um, he is, um, you know, in the, in the 60s and 70s, he was known for fiberglass furniture when that sort of thing was happening. And I have an architectural business that does architectural reproductions. And he, and I wanted to buy a piece of equipment. So in the bottom right is a recent project that I did. And these other pieces are some of those fiberglass, but I bought that piece of equipment and I um, consequently hired me to do molds and some of his fiberglass work for him. So I've been working, worked for him for many years. Uh, but that fir first time when I visited, uh, he had a little private gallery and while he was looking for the key for the shed. I walked upstairs and I saw this amazing piece of, of highly figured curly redwood. And that curly redwood just blew me away. I knew it was wood, but I've never seen anything like it. And this is actually uh, what it looks like right here. And I don't know if you really can tell in online, but the, this, this is what's called chatoyance. And chatoyance is how the light refracts off the, or reflects off the grain, and it makes it look light and dark. So I think it, it's highly three-dimensional. And I saw this and I just couldn't believe uh, how amazing that was. So I, um, at that moment, it changed my life and I decided to dedicate my entire uh, life, uh, you know, to, uh, to learning everything I possibly could about veneer. And um, in fact, on this curly uh, redwood, 10 years later, I found the original source and I bought the rest of it. So I, 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 that's what this door is about. I made a, a series of these pieces. Um, okay, where was I? So uh, Curly Redwood, I, I, I then end up buying. And I wanted to learn everything I possibly could about veneer. So in my uh, perfect style, the way I always work, I, instead of just doing a little box, this is the very first piece I decided to make, which was a dining room table that cracks open and the veneer all spills out. And that was a all hand cut, and even in the early work, this piece is probably 30 years old. You can see I'm starting to ex already experiment with you know, three-dimensional shapes and some lamination, uh, some compound veneering. And there's even some little bits of jade inlaid there. Uh, and I had no idea where I was going with this, but that jade uh, then was sort of a detail of future work where I would inlay uh, gems and minerals into veneer tables which is part of my sort of ongoing theme, which is uh, discovering inner beauty. So a lot of my pieces will have the signature detail where sort of the veneer is pulled up and revealing something more beautiful underneath. And um, <clears throat> also I did a uh, Trump Loy piece on the bottom right, same sort of thing, there's no veneering in that, but that's one of my favorite pieces. Hey Amen. Uh, <clears throat> so that was the very first time I started playing with veneer. Um, but let's step back. I want to kind of talk about veneer and the bad rap that it's got. So veneer has been around for 6,000 years or whenever the uh, Egyptians were. They actually made plywood and used, did their own marquetry there. So it's been around forever. Uh, obviously in the Renaissance, it was considered a high, high art and some very, very fine pieces of furniture were made with marquetry and all sorts of exotic veneers, hide blue. And these pieces are still around and they're not falling apart. And up to today, there are, um, you know, master craftsmen who are using veneer. Uh, Al Sharp, a friend of mine, uh, created this piece sort of in the um, Victorian style, but in a contemporary format, if that makes sense. And if you want to know more about Alf, again, you can go to my YouTube channel. One of the sort of uh, series that I do on my YouTube channel are interview interviews of notable craftspeople. Um, so I've got Wendell Castle, Al Sharp, a whole bunch of people on there, but you, you can go see what he's about. Um, and, uh, you know, even today, this was uh, uh, Kirk. He uh, won last year's Veneer Tech Challenge Award. He, he does a wonderful sort of Art Nouveau pieces. 
and probably some of the nicest marquetry roses I've ever seen. And I'm proud to say he was a student of mine. And on that note, the Veneer Craft Challenge Award, I've won four of those. And now I'm, this is my third year judging. Just a few days ago, we finished the judging on Veneer Tech. So keep an eye out for that. The winner will blow your socks off. It is so over the top. And if you do work veneer, veneer uh, at all, please consider entering it next year. Uh, there's a, a number of categories. In addition, there's a first time entrant. So if, if this is your first time, and maybe your uh, moderate and mid-level sort of uh, skills, you do have uh, an opportunity to win that category because you're not going up against the, uh, the seasoned professionals. Um, but it's a great thing. And um, yeah, wait to keep an eye out for, for that. Um, <clears throat> So the bad rap, in about between the 50s and 60s, veneer got a really bad rap and it wasn't actually the veneer. It was the plywood and the core that the veneer was being uh, laminated to. The glues were not uh, sophisticated enough. Uh, they, did not, they did not yet use urea formaldehyde and uh, things were delaminating. And that's really uh, has lasted quite a long time, this this sort of perception that veneer is, oh, it's, it's inferior product. Well, actually it's not, it's actually superior to hardwood and I'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, you might run into some people who, who have this sort of uh, stigma against uh, veneer and, and it's really because of the, the delaminating plywoods. Actually in, uh, I think it was Vietnam when they're making the pea boats out of plywood, that's when they developed the urea formaldehyde glue, which was then waterproof. And you can now take some of this uh, waterproof plywood and literally put in the water and uh, it won't delaminate. Um, so that's the deal there. So veneer, why veneer? As I mentioned, um, it is actually a higher quality product, meaning when they cut a tree down and if they open it up and they, they see, oh, this has got some figure, instead of shipping it off to the hardwood mill, they will in fact ship it off to the veneer mill for a number of reasons. One, because you can get a higher yield in square footage. So veneer is 1 42nd of an inch. Typically that's a, a Western cut. And uh, so you're getting 42 times square footage out of uh, veneer than you would uh, say a four quarter or one inch thick uh, hardwood board. Uh, it's more consistent in quality. So you can, you can work, do an entire piece or a room and the grain it will be coming from one log. You can get a lot of square footage out of one log. So the grain and the color is very, very consistent. Um, it's also sustainable, which is important these days, again, from yield. And um, you can take smaller trees and you can do a rotary cut and still generate or create veneer. Very cost effective uh, for that reason. Um, uh, it is stable. So by gluing it to a, a core, MDF or particle board, you're going to get a very stable um, element that won't warp or expand and contract and crack and shrink like all the problems we have with hardwood. And don't get me wrong, hardwood is, has its place, but veneer is by far, in my opinion, aesthetically uh, more superior. And again, you get a higher yield out of your veneer. And also for me, you can get figures that you can, just can't get in, um, in regular uh, hardwood. And I'm gonna switch cameras here and show you a couple of examples. Well, for example, the, um, this uh, curly redwood, as I mentioned, I defy you to try to find that in hardwood. I've got some pieces I'm currently working on right now. This is some real sexy, this is uh, figured koa. And I was told that the guy where I got this from said that these were cutoffs from a project that Brad Pitt, he's actually a woodworker or furniture designer on the side. And um, this is really superior stuff. Uh, here I'm getting uh, redwood with sapwood and some fire furled walnut, and you'll see the sapwood is an element that I use, uh, redwood burl, which is domestic. You can get this in the, and it's most notably found in the Northwest. Uh, but you can just have a lot of, a lot of um, access to figures that you just can't get in hardwood. So uh, when it comes to that, uh, it's hands down, there's no question. Um, veneer offers you a wider, for a wider and higher quality uh, you know, figure and, and species, access to different species. So now I wanna show you how veneer is made. This is really cool. If you've never uh, seen this, I'm gonna go through this real quick because I think it's important and, and I've had the privilege to tour a couple plants. Um, so basically logs come into the yard and they will cut them anywhere from 
um, six to 12 feet long and try to get the straightest uh, element they want out of there. They then get debar or de-stumped. So the first, they, they get a big conveyor belt and they go down this conveyor belt and the, the a bit massive grinder with these big carbide teeth um, grind off the taper of the stump for so the, the first uh, flare, if you will, on the bottom. Then the next one uh, stage has two cutters. It goes down and just grinds off all the, all the bark and, and gets rid of all that. It then goes down a conveyor, and if you can see the, uh, oh, I can't do that, my hand, oh, um, <laughs> uh, those orange octagons, those are metal detectors. So it'll go down through three metal detectors to be sure there aren't any, uh, you know, iron nails or whatnot into it. And if they get detected, it then gets kicked off into the field, and a guy goes with a hand detector and finds that, uh, that piece of iron and pulls it out and then gets back, uh, put back in the line. Um, then this is really, really awesome. It goes into a, um, a gantry that holds the, the wood and goes through this bandsaw. And I actually have a video of that. Let's see, quick play here. So it, it rolls back and forth on this gantry. They'll slab it. And uh, this, this bandsaw is, is 32 feet long. It has teeth on both sides. So that is um, really awesome but uh, it, it slices both ways and cuts the log in half. And the log is, is um, kept uh, together. So they pair the logs back up and they soak them in these massive tanks, depending on the species, anywhere from a day to a week at certain temperatures, they wouldn't re uh, reveal that to me. Uh, and all these tanks are, all the scrap wood that's generated from the veneer plant is uh, feeding the fire uh, that heats uh, these tanks, so that's kind of a nice uh, use of all that. It then goes down through, uh, gets uh, planed on both sides, and depending on how it's going to be cut, there might be two grooves put in the bottom, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, veneer can be cut a variety of ways. It can be plain sliced or flat cut, which is primarily how we buy our hardwood. You can also get it um, a quarter sawn, once you get a nice straight grain, you can get rift cut and or rotary cut. And there, there's really those four types, depending on what you're looking for in grain and what type of species it is, depends how they decide on that. But all of this is decided at the very beginning. Every log is tagged with a barcode and follows it from, from literally day, the, the, the day it hits the yard. And in fact, they can then trace this veneer all the way back to where it was cut. And that's uh, uh, real important these days with uh, CITES, which is the uh, endangered species in global export and import. Uh, so it's important to know where you're getting your, your wood from. Uh, here's a rotary cut, massive lathe, massive. I think this is a, a maple burl that is on and it will slide in and the, the, the knife is on the other side. And every rotation, the blade moves in 1 42nd of an inch and slices off uh, the, the pearl, but <laughs> this is a serious lathe for any of you turners out there. Um, another type of lathe is the, the rotary or rift cut. This is a 16 foot lathe. And if you can notice, there's these little two bars on there and they fit into that groove. So during the planning process, if it was gonna be rotary cut, it, there's another head that comes up and cuts these two grooves in. They just put the log on there and there's little T's that turn and hold that log on. And that's all it's holding a log on, which is pretty scary when you're standing there and this thing's whipping around, uh, holding an entire half of a log on there and it apparently doesn't fly off. Uh, and then lastly, there's the plain slice or flat cut where it is craned and held onto this platen, which is a, a, a 25, 225 horsepower, 250 CFM vacuum clamp. So the log is literally just held on there by vacuum. And again, I got a, a, another uh, video on that. And you can see the logs there and it's an up cut. So the blade is slicing up and every stroke it clicks in one forty second of an inch and these sheets just come off. But as you see, they keep these sheets in sequence. And then they inspect leaves every periodically. And when they find a little scratch in there, they will look for maybe a mineral or who knows what's in there and they'll just go in and they'll hand sharpen the blade just with a stone to keep it nice and sharp. But it's important that, and these things are razor sharp. So really, really cool process to see that 
to see that happening. And that's a light table there. So they're actually ins visually inspecting uh, these, um, these pieces of veneer as we go. So um, yeah, that's uh, awesome to, to see. So from there, those leaves come off. Uh, they will pull and do a closer inspection on a light table. And these are still wet because they've been soaking in the tank. So they're very soft, very pliable. They don't crack. And then they go through 350 feet of dryer. So they're put between two screen conveyor belts and it kind of winds up and down all the way down to, dry, to immediately dry the, the, the wood. And it comes off the other side. And when it comes off the other side, they, they stack it in packs of 24 leaves. Typically a log is still kept together, but in packs. You can see it underneath there, uh, every 24 leaves, they sort of shift the, the, the pile uh, back and forth, but they keep the entire log together. Uh, usually from there, it goes right to the, the slicers, uh, I mean, to the trimmers, except for, for uh, some woods like black walnut, it's uh, set out to oxidize. So a black walnut usually isn't that dark. It needs to oxidize to oxygen in about a week. And then you get really nice dark uh, grain and contrast between the heartwood and the sapwood. And here you can see that the two logs have been sliced and they're kept together. And that's really important when you're trying to do large projects and you want architectural match, which is a sequence going all around. Um, so from here, these packs are then inspected. And at this point, they might decide, oh, this particular grain has really nice straight grain, so we're going to quarter it. Right, if we had a, uh, I wasn't gonna talk about this one. Yeah. So uh, this is a, so for example, here's the, the center of the, of, the, of the log and as it goes over, you might get some really nice straight grain and they'll decide to cut this out. And they might cut it, you know, three to six inches wide to get um, that more consistent grain because a quartered sawn, uh, a, a quartered sawn, um, uh, a uh, section of a log is, is worth more. You probably get twice as much money for that as opposed to a plain slice. So these guys, that's what they do. They just make those decisions uh, as they go along and there's a slicer at the very end and he's trimming however he marks that. And then from there, it goes down a, a ramp and gets re sort of stacked uh, by, by log and, and figure. So they might take the flats on and put it in one pile and then the quarter on and put another. Um, and then there's another uh, inspector who will take these. And this is where it gets a little crazy because um, I don't want to say it's a car dealers, but that's the only analogy I can think of. Um, this particular plant has 26 grades and it's somewhat subjective. I mean, obviously the, all the graders are sort of trained and tested to make sure everybody's grading the same, but it's really within that plant. So there's no national sort of spec on, you know, grade A government inspected you know, beef. Uh, they just say this is grade one through 27 and she marks this and prints out a label and, and pastes it on there and that's how it's graded. So uh, they, a plant like this will then ship this out to either directly to manufacturers who are making, you know, plywood or, 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 or uh, planes. Um, and, uh, and then there's also uh, resellers, so distributors. For example, I buy my veneer from Certainly Wood which is Western New York. And when they get it, they might ba buy a certain grade, but they don't have sort of their own grading system. They just have their pricing system and they'll take a whole bundle and go through it again and say, ah, this is really nice. So we're gonna charge this much and this isn't so good and we're gonna charge that. But um, so you can't really predetermine grade. One good thing about a lot of the, um, about the uh, veneer, um, suppliers are, are, everything's online now. I mean, in the old days, I would have to drive to Certainly Wood, which also which always cost me a thousand bucks because besides buying for a client, you know, we'd see some candy in the candy store and I would end up, you know, buying whatever. So I have a pretty nice collection of my own. But now you can go online, they photograph everything and you can then just say, I want this pack uh, from, from this log. Uh, they will only sell you if you're buying onesie twosies and you can buy one, one leaf. In fact, uh, squirrel, hold on. This is actually a really nice, nice piece of... A question? Yeah. On the grades of veneer is usually the smaller the number, the better. Um, uh, that I don't know because it's, it's all based on the, what the plant has set up. Every plant has their own grading system. So you will never 
you will never probably never see that number. And it may not just be a number. It might be a letter. It might be a combination of letters and numbers. They all have their own sort of uh, numbering system. Uh, for example, here's a pack. And there's, you know, the 24, 24 leaves. Maybe that's out of 300. I don't know what the 300 means. 13 might be a, the, the, the log. I don't really know. So there's, there's someone's barcode. And this means nothing to me. And when you buy it. So when you're buying veneer, don't, don't really, don't think, don't worry about the numbers. Just use your eye. Look at the veneer. If you like it, that's, that's, it is what it is. And there's really not much you can do about it. But here's, for example, a really sexy piece of um, veneer that I uh, bought from uh, Certainly Wood. And this is Royal Palm. So again, this is something you probably can't uh, get in hardwood and um, really, uh, really nice. I did say Royal Palm, I'm sorry, Royal Ebony. So this is basically ed like an albino e ebony. And uh, I just love, it's very pictorial. I just like the grain in that. Would you and move your I, face out of the way, babe? Oh, sure, get my face out of the way. So there's, uh, there's what that looks like. I don't know if uh, maybe this is a better camera angle here. But yeah, you can, you can see this is just spectacular. So also very expensive. I think this uh, sheet was nine bucks a square foot, something like that. So that's, uh, that's how you buy veneer. But as I was saying, you, when, you're, uh, when you're buying veneer, you have to, um, when you see it online, you want to um, say, I want this particular pack. Like, you know, they'll only sell you off the top of the pack or the bottom of the pack, because they want to keep the, the sequence consistent. So uh, you can pick from the bottom. So when you're looking at uh, the packs, they usually show you a pack from the top and a pack from the bottom of the entire log. And you can say, you know, give me from, if you don't say, they'll probably just pull it off the top. It's a little subtle because the grain does change as it goes through. So I would 50-50, you know, part of the time I'll say I want it from the bottom. So a little side note there, but everybody uh, shows their uh, veneer online now. And some uh, veneer companies, Herzog, I think, now there are wholesalers, you gotta buy larger quantities, actually has, matching app apps. So you can take this leaf that they have a photograph of, you can say I want a radial, a 12 slice radial, or I want a book match or whatever. And you can even circle a, or put a, a square around that, that's a section of figure, hit the button and it will generate uh, uh, what, what your finished product's gonna look like. Pretty cool. Uh, but uh, Hertz, Herzog um, also does sell smaller quantities when they have sort of uh, off cuts or what have you, you can buy a hundred square feet or something. You're still buying a, 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 a quite a bit. You're not buying one leaf, but um, excuse me. Two questions. Yep. Do you usually buy short two to four feet or long, eight feet or longer? Is there any advantage in quality? And if it's shipped long and comes rolled, how long can it stay rolled without being damaged? Good question. So um, shorts, well, normally I'm buying again from Certainly Wood and you buy what you buy, meaning I'm usually buying long lengths, uh, typically anywhere. Well, burls are, are shorter packs. So um, when I bought this Redwood burl, this is sort of what it looked like here. Get me out of the way. Ah. So that's, that's sort of what it looked like. And they, and they show you those dimensions. The burls are usually uh, short lengths. I typically buy like that last leaf I think that's so, I don't know, eight feet long. They will, um, they will roll uh, the lengths up if you're buying sort of a pack at a time. Um, I will, uh, oh, how long? It depends on your humidity uh, content. I usually don't leave it rolled up. I will unroll it. I might keep it sitting around the shop for maybe a week or two, but I usually unroll it. I have veneer racks and I'll put maybe a, a piece of plywood. I have a bunch of um, strips of plywood on my racks and I'll stack that up and lay that uh, there. Uh, but um, I will also condition my veneer, which I'll get into in, in just in a bit. But um, uh, when you're buying veneer from say Joe Woodworker or Woodcraft, uh, they'll have shorts or Mark Adams. Uh, they'll have sort of these short packs in bundles of, again, this is, uh, should be 24. And um, as far as the quality, you know, again, 
who knows if it's good quality or bad quality. I believe Mark gets these from a, a veneer processor that does the airplanes. Uh, in fact, some of the veneer I have here, the Amboynia was from Steve Jobs airplane and I got off cuts. So these I think are off cuts that he'll, he'll repackage and sell to his students at a pretty good price. I think he wanted 20 bucks for this. Um, this looks like Bobinga, although it's not waterfall. There's some figure here. Um, so yeah, I, I, I sorry, I can't quite answer that question. Uh, it really depends on, on what, um, you know, what it is as far as quality. I just use your eye. That's, that's, that's the key on, uh, on that. So uh, let's go back to, um, that was making veneer. Okay, woo. Okay, so veneer, and again, I'm gonna cover some basics here and we're gonna get to some real crazy stuff in, 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 a, in a bit. But typically, um, veneer is cut sequentially. So when you buy a pack, it is uh, sequence. Let's see, uh, they're all taped up here, but you guys should know what sequence is, meaning that, and the grain slowly changes as it goes through the bee, as, as it goes through the log or from leaf to leaf, but is very, very consistent, right? Uh, so veneer is typically book match. So you sort of open it up and you create this mirrored match uh, pattern. And I have got, uh, I thought I had mirrors here. Oh, another squirrel. I know another thing I wanted to kind of talk about briefly, which is in, in my PowerPoint, but, um, I did briefly want to talk about figures. So again, why veneer? Well, uh, veneer um, usually is defined by two words, the species and the figure. So I might have the um, uh, maple. Uh, this is just flat cut. So we have flat cut here. And as you might be able to see, there is a nice straight grain. They didn't cut this out, but they could have cut this out and sold this as quarter sawn but this is a, a, a flat on, but this is just a regular maple. Maple, you can also get maple bird's eye or bird's eye maple. So typically the uh, first word is the, the definition of the figure. So this is bird's eye maple. And when it comes to bird's eye, there's actually medium and heavy, you know, this light bird's eye, and this is a light, I would consider this, but so it's bird's eye maple. We've all seen curly maple. Again, curly is usually on the quartered sawn. It's not in the flat area here. So it's probably better if you're looking for curly maple. I don't know if you can really see that. I guess you can. Um, if you're looking for, um, if you're looking for uh, real curly, you would want to buy the quartered, the, just the ends, and you don't want to waste your money on the flat sawn. So kind of look out for that. Then we start getting to the stuff that I like. This is quilted maple. Again, quilted is the definition of the figure and maple is a species. And that, that goes through a lot of variety of things. So this is just a regular mahogany. And then that's a pomelie, um, sapili actually, mahogany. So this is sapili, which is a sister of mahogany. And pomelie comes in a variety of figures. So even within the figure, it's really um, terminology. Sometimes they'll say, for example, ah, oh, here's one. If you have a knot, right? They don't call it. They don't call it a knot. They call it a cat's paw, right? That's a figure. Ooh, it's supposed to be nice. And I'm like, and you're just trying to sell some defects, as far as I'm concerned. But um, so you got to look at the veneer and and see what's good. Now keep in mind these are unfinished, and having a little water or alcohol, you can kind of um, see how that's gonna pop. That's still some pretty nice stuff, but this is a more linear grain where this particular, this is actually some super special, this is really hard to find also. And you can see how crisp uh, that figure is there. And that's real three dimensional. It kind of goes in like a quarter of an inch visually. So uh, let's have a little, a little, a little ditty on, on uh, figure. Uh, so back to book matching. So we book match a uh, veneer and that's typically how most people know. And you can make beautiful sort of uh, kaleidoscope images. So this is book matched and end matched. So the four squares book matched one way across the grain. Of course, Burl really doesn't have a grain direction, but, uh, and then it's end matched and you get these sort of sunburst patterns and you can see that they, they uh, book matched around the primer also. So this is very common uh, use of of matching. 
there are a whole variety of ways you can match veneer. So radials are uh, another thing for round tables where you're cutting um, pizza pie triangles and putting them together, creating uh, that sort of match. And I, um, you can use mirrors. That's what that picture is down below to sort of see what that kaleidoscope sort of matching is going to look like. So that's, um, that's an easy way of, of kind of predetermining um, what it looks like. And here's, an, here's another example of that. But it's actually really easy to do. And you're just relying on the beauty of the, of the highly figured wood to, to, to do its thing. There's not much you have to do. And with that said, you don't actually have much control, meaning you can determine where the kaleidoscope is going to be and you can spend all day moving the mirrors around. Um, but that's it. You really, you really, it's, you're going to get a circle, you know, or a, a sunburst or a star kind of, kind of thing. Um, I actually have some other, other examples of radials here. And this is uh, what I plan on teaching in future, uh, future classes. So, um, so you can do uh, various uh, radials, creating uh, symmetrical stars and actually creating these star tips consistent is actually a, 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 an art. There's a trick to that because if you cut a pizza pie plate, pizza pie shape, and this is uh, one, two, three, four, five, or I'm sorry, one, two, three, I think I got them labeled on the back, but uh, if you go around, that grain does slightly change. And if you don't know what you're doing, you're gonna end up with a mismatch. It's a so little out of focus. Yeah, I see that. It uh, should be autofocus. You might have to set that focus. Um, let's try this camera here. That's probably a little better. Um, so you can see the mismatch in your radial. So there is a, an art to, oh, there's the mirrors. There is an art to how do you sequence these and how do you get these tips? I don't know if you can see there's a, circ, a, a line here that I drew and all these tips line up exactly. So uh, that's one of the things we're gonna be teaching uh, in the future. Looking forward to that. A lot of people don't really do that correctly. Uh, so let's go back to the uh, PowerPoint. Um, and of course you can make some, some really cool cutting, uh, dartboards. There's a rosewood dartboard I made in, uh, at Anderson Ranch in Colorado last year. I was teaching there. Uh, in any event, um, what I like to do is have a little more control over that match, if you will. So I sort of specialize in what's called asymmetrical matching. So these are the same leaves. So the, the top is a four-way match and the bottom is the same veneer, but I've done this sort of spin match and, and asymmetrical match. And that's really what I sort of specialize in. And who inspired me sort of uh, to start thinking about that is Silas Koch. He is a master craftsman. He specializes in, in marquetry. Uh, this is a, a wall cabinet, a self-portrait of him. And if you don't know anything about him, check his site out. Uh, really amazing um, uh, craftsperson. And um, I actually took a mold off of his face. We're gonna do a collaboration someday if that ever happens. But some of his work, he does a lot of trump -loy work. So for example, those two doors are actually all flat. That's actually a, a two doors that open up, but he plays with the shadow and lights and really a true master. And then he does a sort of more traditional marquetry. But I took a course from him many years ago at RIT and he introduced me to what's called a double bevel technique where you stack two pieces of veneer on top of one another, you cut it with a scroll saw through at 14 degrees, and you get this sort of scarf joint. That's what that top left image is about. And you get a perfect match, and it is so easy to do. And what I did is I took that, um, that concept, and the first thing I didn't like when working with Burl is you always had a straight line. You would always match it with a straight seam, and you'd always see that straight seam. So the first thing I started doing is doing what I call a wavy contour seam. So I would wave, you know, squiggle through, sort of matching the, the pattern of the grain, and that uh, would help hide that seam. So uh, that is a, a, a great technique to, to make sort of your seams more invisible. And then from there, I started playing with the sapwood and controlling uh, the design. So it wasn't this sort of mirrored, kaleidoscope sort of uh, match, I could do anything I wanted to. Uh, this is one of the pieces that won a Veneer Tech Challenge Award and I designed this for a landscape architect 
And I'm happy to say they gave you sort of free reign. I said, we need a cabinet so big and we'd like some drawers. Everything else is on you. So I came up with a design and this is sort of those, I think they're called fiddleback ferns in the spring, the little curly things. They're actually really good in butter and garlic. Um, but that was sort of the, the concept. And on that note, whenever I do teach techniques, I'm always smattering in little bits of design uh, processes and ways to think. And that's what my newsletter is about. If you signed up for my newsletter, that's sort of, uh, I think every other week or once a month, I'm not sure what it's set at, but you'll be getting a very short newsletter to help you think about different ways of looking at projects and trying to help you uh, work with your creative uh, thought process. I'm using the sapwood. You can see sort of the grain has been hidden and I'm matching up uh, the sapwood, but in fact, I still am book matching. So the, 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 the pattern does repeat. So the grain color really lines up really, really well. And uh, I've done a whole variety of these. So this is for a client, um, various clients here, and some olive ash. Uh, furniture Society, for those who are into furniture making, is a great organization to, uh, to join. A lot of educators there. Uh, I usually uh, lecture for them. This is a, uh, a piece I made uh, when they had their conference at MIT. And it is basically a comprehensive book on veneering from buying, inspecting, cutting, seaming, taping, pressing. And when I teach, also in the book, I don't just teach one method. Because sure, you might have access to a $100,000 hydraulic press, but you may not. So I show how to uh, use a vacuum bag or make your own vacuum bags or using just some coals and some clamps. And these are all topics that I'm gonna be covering down the road uh, for the upcoming classes. I'm sort of breaking it out. Using the book as a guide, in addition to some other uh, new techniques that I've uh, developed. That book is my might be 15 years old. And for what it's worth, I've got a veneer book giveaway. So if you went to imaginegrove.com forward slash giveaways, plural, forward slash veneer book, uh, one lucky viewer will, will get a signed copy of that. So uh, happy to share that uh, with everybody. Um, but I use this, I don't just do the spiral, I use this to create other sort of sculptural cabinetry pieces. Um, this one's quite uh, challenging because I wanted every seam of the cube to be a book match. And that uh, took a little thinking through, but by book matching each square, I could then get a book match on the outside seam. So that book match is all around. And for what it's worth, this actually has a concealed door. The turned piece of pyrite on the bottom is, uh, has a magnet on the bottom of it and has a magnet embedded in the door. And you gotta know where to place it on the door. So when the door is shut, it's a cube. You take the pyrite, you know where to put it on the door, and you can open the door. And the inside of the door is a, a, a variegated gold leaf. Uh, and that's sort of in keeping with my theme, which is inner beauty and discovery. And the deeper you go, the more beautiful it can get. So uh, that's that piece. And here's some student work. This is Kelly Parker. I think one of the gentlemen said they took a course from her, and that's how they found me. This is a piece that she made, which is uh, just beautiful. She turned this into a table. And here's another piece that I've done. Uh, I did this, was inspired by my lovely wife, Nancy, and she is the key to my heart. So uh, part of my design philosophy is incorporating a message or your passion into the work. We can all make beautiful stuff, but it doesn't, if it doesn't mean anything to you, it's just not as, a, not as deep. So this piece particularly has a story now and I can talk about it and, and uh, it maybe it's more, and it's also more enjoyable to make. And it's more enjoyable uh, for me. And I'm going to say, take your face out so we can see the work. Oh, <laughs> uh, fine. Um, so some of the other, we're going to get, let's go take it, let's go back to the beginning here. So some of the first courses that I'll be teaching online here are uh, simple parquetry. And one of the, one of project bases is how to make a chessboard. And these projects are really easy to make uh, just with a cutting board and you literally a straight edge and utility knife you can make these. Uh, I know people are sort of locked down. They may not have access to uh, certain equipment. So um, you can certainly do this. I'll also be teaching uh, how to create, lay out and create an inlay, a Nautilus star. So um, real fun uh, to do that. And then of course you can have a, get a little crazy, but parquetry is a, a really uh, great way to work sort of on your dining room table with a cutting mat. Um, and you create these great patterns. For example, some of the beginning patterns is what's called a Lewis cube. So you're sort of making this parallelogram diamond shape and uh, putting it together, you make this little box and you can um, really create some great patterns. And I think I've got a 
sample of that here. So there's a, there's a Lewis cube. And we'll be talking about various things. So you can accent or highlight or shadow one side. We pay attention to grain direction. So this is more of a, a overlapping where here I try to emulate the sides of a box. So subtle, um, subtle detail in grain direction can make a big difference in the aesthetic. Um, so that is always, um, always uh, fun to play with. And I love carpentry because you can do it sort of just literally uh, relaxed. Uh, you know, outside drinking with a utility knife. <laughs> uh, run with scissors. Don't run with scissors. Uh, here's some other, you can see uh, sort of a, a weave uh, a pattern, very three-dimensional, but it is the same shape. And you can get more complex. So parquetry is a wonderful, great way to start into veneer and, you know, have a little hands-on. So if you want to do a box or something, granted, you could just take a sexy piece of veneer and glue it on there, but you know, let's, let's do some inlay. You could inlay a star, do some parquetry patterns. Um, and here's a, a student's uh, uh, a console where they did the front. And here we actually inlaid uh, a piece of holly, I think, to really uh, ac accentuate the pattern. And of course, uh, I always encourage everybody to kind of cut their pieces apart and have fun with it. Uh, if you approach a project when it's, where it's not going to be um, precious, meaning you actually start a project and say, this is not going to become a finished piece. You're freer to make mistakes and experiment. And I really encourage doing that because you can get real crazy, cut things apart, and you never know what you're going to come up with. In fact, um, a couple students uh, of mine, one was a um, fashion designer and very in tune with patterns and you know, came up with some really nice patterns. I think that was the bottom right. And the, the left side was... Um, Miss Tobago from Tobago, and she was also in um, fashion. So it seems like a lot of fashion people really are in tune with the patterns. Uh, along with parquetry, you can also do something called sand shading. So that's another great quality of veneer where you can sort of dip it in some hot sand and you can, you can burn the edges to get more of a three-dimensional shape. You can really create a, a, a weave. So here's, a, here's, a, here's uh, one that I did here. And there are some tips and tricks. And here is a sort of corner, corner fan. I actually thought maybe during the class we would do a, a large table in this style. I think that would be kind of fun, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. But sand shading is a great, um, a great way to accent, accentuate your, your parquetry patterns. Um, it's basically pi pyography is another way of doing it where you actually take sort of soldering iron. They, they make actually special ones with special tips and you can actually burn into the, into the veneer, but you're almost burning all the way through, so you can go ahead and sand it. You're not gonna sand away uh, the burning, the design, but these are some uh, real exquisite examples of pyography, and so if, you're, if you like to draw, uh, you, know, you might wanna try giving your hand here. Um, but what I really enjoy is the chatoyance, and that's what turned me on from day one with, uh, with the veneer. Uh, I just love that shimmer and that wow effect. It just, I, I just, I'm the one who always goes to the museum and, you know, touches something. Oh yeah, that's really focus. It's out of focus. I guess that's a good reason to take that away. So I like to pick veneers. This is satin wood on a purple heart. And um, this is satin wood right here. And you can see it's, I don't know if you can tell, but it has just some wonderful shimmer to it. Let me put a little alcohol on there. Um, but it, you, you know it's wood, but you've never seen that kind of figure before. And I, I just love that wow effect. So I'm always the one getting kicked out of museums because I've got to touch everything. I like work that draws you in and you have to go, wow, and you, you touch it. And veneer offers that, that quality real easy. Uh, Thomas Schrunk, another friend, um, he actually takes the parquetry concept which are just two inch squares. So these panels are made up of two inch squares. He's using a high chatoyant um, figured wood and he's changing the grain direction 15 degrees on each square. So he cuts a whole bunch of these, zero, 15, 30, and 45 degrees. And by then orientating them in, in different combinations, he can control the chatoyants. And he creates these wonderful curved patterns. And when you walk around, they shimmer, they, 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 they move. They're just spectacular. 
but it's very, very basic parquetry. Um, I, on the other hand, like to do work with chatoyants. Also, here's a piece that I made where I do patchwork uh, pattern. Again, it might have to do with uh, my mother, I'm sure, and my defiance. Uh, God rest their soul. But uh, someone says, oh, you have the book match. And I'm like, I'm not doing it. I don't want a book match. So I created this piece here. And these are patchwork pieces, just random sort of shapes. And I changed the, the chatoyants every uh, 15 degree or 30 degrees in this piece. Uh, so when you walk around this table, the light and dark bounce around. They change color or change from light to dark as you walk around the table. A uh, real fun piece. And again, there's a gem inlay and sort of that pullback detail that uh, people start asking for. Uh, other people's work also work with chatoyants. I think this might be crotch mahogany or seagrass mahogany. Uh, again, larger sort of leaf patterns. Uh, so, so matching can be, and these are all straight cuts. So this is something you can just do with a knife. It's, it's not that difficult. You're um, just kind of thinking outside the box and, and switching up the, um, the grain pattern. Uh, marquetry, I think what people commonly know, we looked at Silas's work. Again, here, this is a student where you can actually just take a, a if you're not good at drawing, you can just take an image out of you know, National Geographic and do sort of a block. Uh, model, no sand shading, no, not much attention to changing the color or the hue to create three-dimensional surfaces. And this works really well. Your, your logo, for example, if you have one or, or just, uh, you know, something, you know, black and white image uh, that uh, is very successful. And then, of course, you can take it all the way up to uh, more of a, um, you know, traditional marquetry with sand shading and using different uh, grains of wood. In fact, Silas, he doesn't keep his wood by species. He has a whole bunch of boxes where he keeps it by color. So he has, you know, light to dark and red, dark red, browns. And that's how, uh, and he'll save all his little scraps because some of those inlay pieces are, are really, really uh, small. In fact, here's a piece, if you haven't seen this online, that I just created in response to obviously the local or the recent pandemic. But this is all uh, sort of done in marquetry. And in fact, you can also buy dyed veneers. So you don't have to be, don't have to rely on the natural color of, of a veneer. You can actually buy it. There's a whole rainbow of colors that you can uh, buy. There's another gentleman. He's, uh, uh, I was in a show in Paris and he exhibited along uh, in that show. And boy, he was really crazy doing sort of parquetry and sort of free flowing these sort of fabric. And that's all flat. And what I do appreciate for these people there is they don't are they aren't concerned with function I think a lot of us everything has to be functional and they're just making wall hanging pieces that are art unto itself so the marquetry has come to another high level here's a student of mine and I'm still not sure what the, he's trying to say here to this day if anybody's got an idea what this means <laughs> he didn't tell me but I was talking about personal expression and what what do you what do you believe in and this was his marquetry piece that he came up with so obviously it's the Charles Eames chair, uh, but I don't, know what the, well, I don't know what's going on there. In any event, there's that piece uh, I just showed you and you can see the rainbow of colors that you can get in dyed veneer. And that veneer is dyed all the way through and UV stable. So you can sand it and the color won't change or bleed through when you're trying to finish. Another uh, interesting technique, that same uh, show in Paris where this one lady was sanding through. I know a lot of us are, are worried about uh, you know, are, are you going to sand through the veneer? Oh my God. Well, she's intentionally sanding through to sort of blend uh, the, the colors and forms. And I wish I had a picture of it, but she also did these um, hummingbirds and would do three hummingbirds in separate packages, if you will, or, or sheets, glue them on top and then sand through until she partly saw the hummingbird that was glued underneath. So you had sort of this mist sort of uh, effect where you get the real three-dimensional uh, quality. I thought that was uh, really revolutionary. Scott? Yeah. Does certainly wood carry dyed veneer or do you have any other suggested source? Uh, certainly wood does carry a dyed veneer. Um, Mark Adams sells uh, uh, this, Bob's is this, I don't want to say his last name, he dyes the veneer, so does Mark, but Mark doesn't sell what he dyes for himself. Bob does. And he's actually wants me to sell it. So we may, in fact, be selling it. 
Uh, and I do know there's another one out west. I don't recall the name. And if Nancy, if you could make a note of that, I will uh, I'll make sure we get that link. There, there are a couple places that sell dye veneers. And I'm sorry, I don't have that at the top of my head. I can barely remember what I had for lunch. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we can get that link to you. And if you email me directly, I can certainly follow up. I, it's just not on the top of my, my, my tongue here. Um, and again, veneer is great for sort of conference tables and dining room tables. And the point being is if you're using high quality veneer, uh, you can get a better price, but the labor doesn't change. So making these, uh, that one's an 18 foot conference table and you can just, you know, straight grain, cherry or what not, fine. The veneer may cost you an extra hundred bucks, but you can get an extra 5,000 for the table. And the labor is pretty much the same. If it has to be flattened, maybe a veneer flattening, but uh, so think about using that if you do any <coughs> reselling of, of your own work, just by upgrading with, with a real, real, you know, sexy piece of veneer. And you'll see this in, in architectural work, veneers used um, throughout the country. And this is um, last year's veneer tech winner. Uh, so home offices, reception desk, and, and also veneer allows you to do curved elements. It's a lot easier and more consistent. You couldn't do this on hardwood. Um, certainly curved elements are employed into furniture, which again gives you uh, um, more consistency. So I have this, you know, there's another student where you, you know, the, all the veneer is from the same lot. So if you try to do this in hardwood, it would be pretty difficult to try to make it all match up. Another student working with the, um, uh, the chatoyants and doing some inlay and again a curved drawer front, which is quite spectacular. Architectural work, you can do you know, curved elements that are lightweight. And also lighting is really cool. Another student, I think these are um, garlic cloves. Uh, here's a, another uh, piece. Oh, I got a piece of this. So as I mentioned, the veneer is uh, cut at 1 of an inch. Well, there's actually one mill in Japan that cuts at 1 100th of an inch. And these are uh, some lighting project I did for a client in Florida. And this is that uh, veneer here. It's so thin that they actually cover it with a very thin sheet of uh, plastic. So it's very flexible. Of course, I'm not sure if you can tell, but it's translucent. So it's a beautiful, beautiful, warm, uh, warm glow that, that that light puts out. So uh, certainly, yeah. Quick question. Do we know who did the sand through art, the sanding through the veneer? Uh, I do, and again, if you um, if you email me, I can get you her name. Uh, she's out, out of Paris. We actually, Nancy and I visited her, um, and I just don't remember oh, her right. name. Uh, but the, the thin veneer puts out a really nice glow. You can get this sort of effect with a regular veneer, and you can glue it to acrylic, which you can thermal form and glue on with epoxy. So you can achieve these sort of lighting effects, but consider that because the glow that it puts off is just spectacular. Another thing you can do with veneer is you can actually glue one surface of a project. So here's another piece of, of mine, a production piece, where I had a turned um, half sphere that is copper coated and variegated and patinaed, and then I just put the quilted maple on top. Another piece, this is actually a fiberglass hull. So you don't always have to glue veneer to wood, you can, or, or particle board, you can glue it to other materials like the acrylic for a lampshade or here, uh, this is a fiberglass hull. And the reason I did that is for shipping. Uh, this is, that's a hollow, a hollow hull, so it shipped real easy uh, and cost effective. Other things you can do, uh, as Michael Cooper, is um, you can create these um, very strong structural elements. Uh, and the, the technique that, that I teach and that he is really perfected is sort of this string wrapping. So you take rope, or um, actually we've upgraded this from rope now to uh, bicycle tire tubes works even better. And you can wrap it around a bundle of veneer and you can twist it in any different direction. Uh, you can certainly do this in sort of a vacuum bag also, but what this allows to, if you can see on the left-hand photo, you can split the two open, which you couldn't do in a vacuum bag. Here they're sort of wrapping it around a wine bottle and making sort of a wine, a wine bottle, um, a, a wine bottle sort of rack. And we just did this la in last week's class. Here's sort of my example of that. And here, what I'm doing is creating sort of a Mobius strip. So I took the two ends and weave them to weave them together. Uh, so that also is really, and I twisted it around. 
Uh, granted, there's going to be a lot of sanding and what have you, but uh, and here I only use maybe half a dozen leaves. I'd probably want to go twice as much on that. And when I talked about in vacuum bags, so you can also do uh, elements like this. And here's where it is a homemade bag, which I'll be doing in another class, putting it in a bag and wrapping it around, you know, an object. And that's how, in fact, how they make uh, staircase stringers, spiral staircase stringers. That's actually um, how they do move those large things. But that will be a whole separate class unto itself. Um, but it's really fun to do. Uh, other students work sort of using some of these techniques. In addition, if you're doing uh, Mike Whittall, I should have put his name on here. Uh, if you have a hardwood piece of furniture, but you want to upgrade the figure, you can, after you finish the piece, you can glue veneer over it. So this whole piece is hardwood. And then he glued it with, I think it was a curly sycamore or something, a beautiful piece. And um, so you're getting the structural properties of the hardwood uh, and uh, the aesthetic properties of the highly figured wood. Um, Richard Judd, another person, he's doing the lamination. So that is also something that we'll be teaching. And I've got an example of this. I'm actually uh, just finishing up a job right now with, with that. So this is where you're doing a, a lamination and then veneering uh, just on the outside surfaces. Extremely strong, no spring back. Uh, great technique. Oh, and here's another one of those spiral uh, laminations that we, that we did. So um, yeah, you can create wonderful forms with curve um, veneer bagging techniques. This is a bed I created. And the uh, side wings uh, out of lacewood, in fact, not only is it, is it a conical shape, it actually goes from two inches down to one inch. So in this particular one, it's actually tapered. And there's a concealed drawer, and that has a wangy top with a silver uh, edge detail on that. And uh, some curved doors. This is a, another award winner. This is my um, grand prize winner for Rainier Tech. And there's silver on top, and that's an embonia top. And actually, that, that football shape in the center actually lifts up, and there's a TV that pops up out of that. Uh, and all those panels are floating off the wall. But you know, you can do a lot of, a lot of great curved stuff and lightweight. Uh, another core that you can use, which is what those uh, mahogany panels are, are a honeycomb. So instead of using particle board or MDF, you can use a honeycomb uh, cardboard or in a uh, commercial and uh, aeronautic industry, they actually use aluminum honeycomb. Comb. But it's basically corrugated cardboard and you're veneering to that. So you can create very lightweight, super stable, super strong uh, veneer panels. Um, here's another, oh, I forgot the cinema names out of South Korea. Uh, creating this cabinet, and we'll also show in the future classes how do you veneer uh, just one surface. So this is just a cardboard drum I kind of grabbed, and you couldn't put this in a press. Uh, you couldn't put the whole thing in a vacuum bag. You could probably try to figure out how to make uh, call clamps, but you'd have to have a really deep throat clamp because there was a, a cardboard bottom on there. So how do you veneer that surface? You can actually vacuum bag one surface with sort of um, glazing tape, and it would just suck down on one surface. So there's some a lot of tricks and tips that I'll be sharing on various veneering and getting to more reality. I'll show how to do a, um, a waterfall edge. Uh, you can either mix up the grain or you can line up the grain. And this is sort of now getting to compound veneering. So that that doesn't curve just on one plane, it curves on, on, on two axes. And you have to stretch and compress the veneer and there's a, this is another one of my specialties where when I teach at Mark Adams, we, we, we veneer everything. Every year, Mark actually challenges me to try to veneer something. So there's a, a face of a casting I took. Uh, the students did those finials. Every student actually did the fence post finials out of Burled Walnut. Uh, we did a bowling ball, waterfall edge. And uh, a couple of years ago, we actually said, okay, I want you to do a working light bulb. And it can't be with burl, because actually burl wood is the easiest wood you can compound veneer. And I was able to do that. Um, and then here's that uh, three-way spiral. And as I mentioned, the sphere on the bottom is uh, compound veneered. And that cone shape is veneered. And that's actually the hardest way you could possibly uh, bend veneer, kind of going curved one way and then bending around the other, if that makes any sense at all. And just to add uh, insult to injury or challenge myself, I then said, well, how? How could you do a, 
a curved inlay on a, on a shape like that. And the trick there, so this is the tip for the day, is if you're trying to do a, an inlay, you, you're gonna do it with a router, right? But you need to create a, a template or a template guide to guide the router. But how do you create a template guide to wrap around that kind of form? You take quarter inch or eighth inch acrylic, and if you heat it up, it's thermal forming. So you can tie the acrylic into a knot. It becomes very flexible. So you take that acrylic, you then wrap that around, use some stretchy tape, and you conform or form the acrylic to that shape. You know, five minutes later, it, it gets rigid, and now you have yourself a multi-axis compound curve template guide. So that's how I did that inlay there. Uh, I also do body forms, as you saw. This is Garth Bagan. He was the choreographer for The Lion King, where I took a mold off of his face. I then did a casting of his face. I modified that casting with clay to become sort of a Lion King mask, and then uh, made a compression mold out of that, made two more molds, and we did this in a compression mold. This is a mask where I didn't want to glue it onto a casting. I wanted to have a, a, a shell, if you will. So uh, that was actually veneered on both sides, but I, I then decided to gold leaf the inside of the mask, uh, then also adhering to sort of my inner beauty sort of thing. He ended up buying that piece. Uh, and then this is another Wiener Tech Award winner, uh, Melissa, which I actually have here. Which camera should I use? Two. This is Melissa. This is another uh, Veneer Tech Challenge Award. Maybe, maybe that's not the right camera. Maybe we should go to four. Um, and zoom out. So, oh, pan right. Okay. Um, so this I actually was my very first one. It was an experiment, and I did this with two pieces of veneer. You can see the sapwood goes right down the center. So there's literally just two pieces of veneer, and this was done in a vacuum bag. So that was a, a really fun project. Uh, there she is there. So I sort of developed a method that will allow you to stretch and compress the veneer. In fact, side tip of the day is uh, if you're trying to do steam bending or uh, molding veneer, you don't want to stretch it because it'll tear and crack. You want to compress it. Uh, so the fibers will slip past one another uh, on, to a, on say, unlimited, but quite a bit, uh, up to 100%. But if you're trying to stretch, you only get maybe 5%. So that's sort of the key. And again, we'll be uh, covering this in one of my future classes. We have a model that has volunteered and she, we're going to be doing a custom fit bustier for her. So that will be a, a real fun project. This is Greg Zanida, a student of mine, become a good friend, and we did his hand here also, and that was a, really a great project. He's also done a fist and his hand out of Burl Walnut, and some other students. Uh, this is a student at Skyland, Bombay Chest. This is an iron-on technique, and I don't even recall if this is a student. I just like this piece. I think this might have been, but I'm not sure. Oh, no, this is, a, this is a, someone I judged in. AWSF out in Vegas last year. I believe that was an entry in that where it was all veneer and I appreciated the veneering the, the you know, the half, the quarter of the sphere. And another student of mine did his motorcycle. So you can really veneer anything you want. Um, so hopefully that has inspired you uh, to, to, to um, you know, try looking into doing things with veneer. As you can see, you do a whole variety of things with veneer and uh, it's really limitless. Um, I also remind you, remember to go, if you want a, a copy of the book, enter uh, to get a signed copy of my book. Uh, other things that if you want to kind of follow me, so I also have imaginewoodworking.com. That's sort of the main landing page. If you just go there, that will take you to my personal site, my educational site books and plans and, and courses. We also have a company that sells inlay, exotic inlay, mother of pearl and opal and PowerShell. Uh, and then I've also designed a tool called the Ultimate Router Base. Uh, that's real exciting. There's nothing else out there on a the market like that. Here's my cheap sales pitch on that. And then other places I can be found uh, on American Wood Shop by Scott Phillips. So that just dropped, I think a few days ago. Um, and that is showing how to do some hard, I have two episodes. One is inlaying the opal on a pen. The other one is how to create a, a curved flag uh, cutting board uh, with my template guide system. So uh, that's coming up, that's when just been dropped. I do write for Woodworking Network and FDMC. I have a column in Woodshop News because I also write on a business. I do craft business. 
And AAW, if any of you are wood turners out there, uh, all the shows have been canceled. So all my traveling has been canceled, but they're doing a live event. They have some headliner turners, which I'm not a headliner turner, uh, but we are sort of second tier. Uh, I'll be doing demonstrations two times a week, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday on how to inlay um, gems and minerals and things like that. I and that's next weekend. That's next weekend. I believe that's 20 bucks. You'd have to go to AAW, American Associate, American Association of Wood Turners, <clears throat> sign up, and it's, you know, you can bounce around between the headliners and all the vendors have brought, not all, a number of the vendors have brought in people who are doing demonstrations using their tools and products and what have you. And that's sort of what we're doing also. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's, that's it. How do we do on time? I think we're an hour and a half, an hour and a quarter, right? It's one eighteen. Oh man. Hold on. <laughs> we have a question and I, actually Mark, I was going to ask the same question to remind Scott, please give a brief outline of what subsequent presentations you'll be focusing on. So what are some oh. of the classes you're doing? What's our next one? I will give you the date in just a minute. And um, just, you know, tell us sure. what we're going to learn. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the next one, it'll be, the plan is the first Sunday of every month at noon. August 2nd uh, is the next one. Okay, there you go. Uh, and the, the courses I'm going to probably go sequential. I think that might be the best way to do it, meaning the next class will be um, basic cutting, seaming, inspecting, buying, uh, all the different ways you can, you can seam it. And we'll probably cover pressing too. Uh, we're gonna kind of get as much as we can in that one class. It's sort of fundamentals of veneering. I wanna get the fundamentals out of the way, but if, even if you're an experienced veneer person, there may be some tips and tricks. I've picked up techniques from all over the world and all the different people I know from the guy who does Rolls Royce steering wheels to uh, production shops who do architectural panels. So we'll be sharing hopefully a variety of things in addition to many different ways. So not just using um, a utility knife, all the different ways to use a, a veneer saw, how to sharpen a veneer saw, how to cut on a table saw or a joiner, you know, we'll be cutting all of that. So that'll be the next class. And um, after that, we'll probably go into a parquetry or we might do actually a chessboard. We'll maybe bounce back and forth between projects and basic uh, techniques uh, from there. But I'll be laying this out. This whole thing is all new to me. And we're gonna make it hopefully a lot easier where you can click on a link and it'll automatically add it to your calendar. Um, hopefully Zoom is a good format. Uh, we'll, when we get that list together, we'll, we'll let everybody know. In addition, we've had a number of people email me from around the world who obviously aren't gonna get up or stay late depending where, where they are. Um, so after they've been done, we're gonna take the recording and um, make that available also. Uh, so you can go back and review that. If you miss one month, you can go back and you could just watch the recorded ones. And then what are yep. you working on right now? What am I working on right now? I am working on, let's see, a couple things. A stool, let's see if I can, which camera, three probably might be the, might be the best. So I guess I'll get my head out of the way, it'd be good. So this is a, a stool, so a friend of mine, Andrew Muggleton, uh, out of the Netherlands. He lives in Amsterdam, but he has a client in Chicago. And this is actually the only time I would do this. I normally don't do other people's designs, but this is a stool. So that's uh, the curved lamination, uh, pommel sapili. And for what it's worth, this joint, it was a real challenge trying to get, uh, this is curved, this is curved, this is also angled. So trying to figure out that joint uh, was really fun and I, I'll be posting sort of uh, that, I, I filmed that one. So I've been working on that. I also been uh, playing with this uh, little guy here. This is uh, filigree inlay. So this is a, a bowl. So this is a silver filigree and this is a brass and silver with our opal inlay. So this will, uh, we actually just finished a book on this. We have an ebook. That's another book that we, we just finished, um, how to do that. That's really fun. It's a great way of accenting your, uh, your work. So those are the two. Oh, I'm sorry. And I, oh, yes. And that Koa, hold on. This is what I'm going to do today. 
Because Nancy's away. So when Nancy's away, Scott plays. Not that I don't play when she's here. But this, um, this is a, I can't, I feel like a news person. Let's go to overhead. I don't have to. So this is a, a form that I'm going to be taking that koa that I showed earlier, this curly koa and pomely sapelia. I'm making two of them. So I'm going to be veneering this surface. So I'm writing an article for American Wood Turning Magazine. And uh, this is um, for an article there. And that's what that shapes with it is a compound curve. And I'll be veneering this because the idea is um, if you want to turn something large and use a real exotic piece of wood, it may be difficult to find that blank. In addition, I'm going to probably do maybe the satin wood on the inside surface so you can do different planes to create different, uh, different sort of looks. So that's sort of what, what I'm doing uh, today and uh, having fun. I have a couple more questions. Sure. Uh, the veneered hand, was that veneered all at once or piece by piece? And uh, that, uh, hold, that on, was done. hold on, hold on. <laughs> and what's the trick to getting a hardwood edge on a curved veneer surface? Sure. Um, the hand was done uh, in multiple pieces. I think that hand was actually done just in two, in two molds. You can go on the front and the back. Um, his fist, I think, was done in, in eight molds because there's something called draft when you're taking a mold. If I, have a, if I put this in a piece of concrete, I would never be able to get my hand out because it, it, it locks itself in. So you're making a rigid mold, which is what you have to do to make what's called the compression mold. You have to make sure you have drafts. So you have to make sure you can get your hand off. So I think we did sort of the back and then the top. We did this side. I think we did a little one in there and then one here. I, I don't know, Greg, if he's online. I get this glow. I see this weird line here, but anyhow, um, so he did, that was actually harder to do. Uh, so that was, uh, so multiple, multiple molds. And that was done with a compression mold, not a vacuum bag mold. So again, there's different ways to do compound curving. That was the first question. What was the Greg said, question? Greg says, yes, that was correct. Correct. Thanks, Greg. And Greg has really big hands too. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> what was the other question? Uh, let me see. What was the trick to getting the hardwood edge? On oh, the hardwood edge, yes. Cur curved veneer surface. Okay, so uh, there, is a, there are a number of, 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 of ways to do uh, the hardwood edge. Um, get me out of here. Uh, if you have a, a, a rolled edge, there's really nothing you can do about this. So this was done with MDF. What I will do to sharpen the corner up is soak it with uh, CA glue. So if I take super glue and soak that in, that'll make that edge really hard and um, more durable. Another way is to inlay a piece of hardwood and make that exposed. This actually has a piece of uh, luthier purfling in there. In another course, we'll be showing how to do various uh, string inlays. Um, but another thing that you can do is you can take your edge, oh, I didn't do it on this one, you can take your edge and you can put eighth inch hardwood on the outside before you veneer over it. You wouldn't want to go more than eighth inch because uh, the hardwood that's applied to the edge. Uh, so if I put a piece of hardwood on, on the edge and veneered over it, uh, what's going to happen is the MDF is very stable. And the TEC, thermal expansion coefficient, is going to be different. And this wood is going to expand and contract, and you're, and you're going to get a telegraph seam over time here. So going more than an eighth of an inch, you risk, uh, you risk that telegraphing. Another way that I've done it, and that's maybe what I did on, what's that other one? Other one I'm holding. That's actually what I did here, is um, instead of using hardwood, I just used a number of layers of veneer. So that's called sort of free ply. So I can make my own super thin uh, veneer. You'd want a cross band. So I would glue three layers like that and making, and I would make uh, plywood. And then I can bend that. So it's, it's, 
when it's all glued together, it's just a real thin sheet of, of sort of hardwood. It's become solid now, it's, but it's also, if I use PVA glue, you can still bend it. And that gives you a much more durable edge on, on a table edge. You know, you really have to decide what's a vulnerable edge or not. You know, cabinet door, for example, I didn't, uh, I just glued uh, the veneer on, although this is actually was thick veneer. So hopefully that answers that question. Okay. You got any other questions? We do. Um, when will you announce the book winner? Oh, uh, your volume just dropped off. I'm not sure why. But uh, the book winner, I think it should be uh, on there. I think it's the, um, the end of the week of this week. Uh, it's in the system. What I want to do is we're going to try to get this recording up because there's a number of overseas people who want to watch this. So I want to give them an opportunity to enter. So my hope is, is I'll have the recording up and running in a couple of days and then they can watch it and sign up for the giveaway. So I think it's next weekend we'll do that. Um, yeah. And I don't want to miss any of the classes. Will they be available online uh, on demand for the five dollars, the additional classes coming up? Yes, they will be. Yeah. And again, I'll be the IT side of this. We're trying to keep, we're keeping up barely. So we will be getting uh, the recordings listed online. They'll be available for purchase. And are all your, are all your flat uh, cores MDF? Um, typically, yes. Typically, yes. I use MDF, although I just finished a dining room table that was honeycomb core because it had removable leaves, right? So you'd want them to be a uh, light and stay flat. Usually, this actually was a gaming table. So the leaves came out and, and you had this sort of void. Apparently, this couple has the sort of gaming parties and everybody come on and you, these games last for months. So she wanted a large, uh, you know, playing field and then she could put these uh, leaves on top. So in that case, I went with honeycomb. So it was very strong, certainly stronger than the MDF, uh, but um, also lightweight. But primarily I use MDF. If it's a, a moist environment, like a bathroom, maybe a dining room table, I would use what's called MedEx. So that is a waterproof, not resistant, but it's a waterproof uh, MDF. You can throw a piece of that in the, in, in the pond, which we have, and it, and it won't, swell up or do anything. That's what sign makers use to make, you know, these signs to apartment complexes. And uh, if you use urea formaldehyde glue, which is a waterproof glue, you can get a really uh, waterproof uh, uh, layout. Okay, so we have a, a question that's off topic, but one of our participants has a router base. The question is, why is your router base ultimate? Ah, <laughs> ultimate. Okay. Um, so I do have this router base here. Hold on. I've got one, a link, but, uh, so I designed this, uh, router base. Hold on. Which camera will we use three? I think will be the best here. So, um, hold on. Let me, oh, by the way, I get rid of me. Uh, so I created this, uh, when, I, when I taught that hardwood edging class in inlay, that was that key to my heart shape, um, to, to make a curved seam line out perfectly, you have to offset a router base to either side of the cutting seam. And that's very much like, um, like the little inlay bits that you use, a little inlay router bit. And, um, but if you're trying to do eight quarter hardwood, you need to supersize that. So you need to go with a half inch router, um, a half inch router bit. And with a half inch router bit, you need a inch and a half template guide. So I just wanted to buy it and nobody sells it literally. And they all missed the boat on that one. So, uh, we would make them for years out of, um, out of acrylic and, and aluminum and turn them on a lathe. Um, but then, uh, students would, would, when they're doing a router work on edge, they would accidentally rock their, um, their work and ruin, and ruin the piece. It's never happened to any of us, but you know, the center of gravity is hanging off the edge. So at that point I then said, okay, let's get a extended router base. And that gives you more stability, more control, but you have to have a extended router base that accepted a template guide. 
And I got a removable disc here, which I'm going to see if I can find. I wasn't ready for this. I should have been. Oh, there it is. So again, I went out and tried to buy an extended router base that had a, that accepted a standard inch and three sixteenths template guide, right? That's your standard template guide. And that would fit in there and nobody made this. So at that point I said, okay, somebody's missing the boat. And we went ahead and had this made. And while I was having it made, I said, okay, what else can I do to uh, include on this? So I really wanted to make it the ultimate router base. So I put a, a removable disc in here so you could accept larger router bits. I have um, guide pins, which you'll just have to trust me, that screw in here. So the guide pins, guide pins stick in there. So if you're trying to do a self-centering mortise, you twist it and you can do mortise cuts. I then, uh, for me, cutting circles has always been a pain in the ass. That's the technical term. So I created a center slot and you can make your own adjustable um, adjustable base. So you can put a pin in here and, and make those fine adjustments or take the handle off and put a six foot arm on there. But you always try to get it and you, it always has to be adjustable. So this is a, a six inch uh, swing. This will slide back, back and forth um, six inches, plenty of room. I also added uh, side slots. So if I want to put a fence on, on the slides uh, here, I can also take those pins, which I can't find at the moment, put those pins in there and that'll allow me to do a curve, a curved edge because you, you only want to touch two points when you're doing a curved radius. Um, oh, but wait, there's more. I also give you a, uh, a drawing disc. So this is uh, to put on a curved surface and you put a pencil in there and when you draw this, it draws a line a half inch off of your off of your template. So now you know exactly where that cut's going to be. That helps in layout. I provide a centering pin. So when you're installing this on your, uh, in your, your um, template guide socket, these sockets are never dead center on the router. So this allows you to loosen the bolts and move it around and make sure it's dead center, whichever router you may have. And then the best part about this is I actually have a patent on this one, or patent pending. So if I want to cut, say, a piece of plywood, which is the uh, only way to, to accurately cut veneer. So if I say I want to cut this table edge, uh, I wouldn't want to make it one, one cut, right? I would want to sort of um, make a rough cut and then a fine cut. So what I would do is I'd put a, a fence and run and run my uh, router against the fence. The problem is, is that if I want to make a, nut, a secondary cut, so I'm doing it this way, right? There's my fence, I'd make my rough cut. Then I'd have to move this a little bit or put a little shim sheet in there. I'm sorry, move this this way, take the shim sheet out and make a secondary cut that would take another, say, 16th of an inch off. Well, if you try to move this, you're never gonna get it lined up again ever exactly. The shim sheet is probably the best way to go, but that's always tough to do. So what I do is since we've used our centering pin to perfectly line up your template guide, you now know that it's perfectly centered. And I have marked right on here, four and a half inches. So we know it's four and a half inches from the curved edge to the spindle center. You subtract your quarter inch for a half inch router bit if that's what you're using. And you make your first cut, first cut this way. Then without moving your, temp your fence, you turn this sideways and the straight edge subtracts a sixteenth of an inch. So I make my second cut and I can cut an additional sixteenth of an inch off without moving my fence. So I can make a rough cut and a finished cut. And uh, that was just kind of something I thought about. And for what it's worth, my uh, late night bonehead move is, um, I was like, well, hey, we should put a ruler on here and mark it in millimeters. Well, I don't apparently know my millimeters and I, instead of going from 100 to 110, I went 100 to 200, 300. And by the time we got way up, way up here, we were at like 1400. And one of my students from Norway said, you know, I'm 1460 millimeters tall or whatever he said. And I was like, oh no. So I have, I don't know, about 30 of these left. The scale is off, but I do provide a peel on sticker. That's what this is all about. And then what's not my mistake, is that this scale slightly stretches a 32nd of an inch over six inches. 
And I don't even know how that happens. I mean, I was really quite upset about that, but um, it is what it is. Uh, we now have since uh, changed manufacturers. I can't tell you a major manufacturer that uh, the company gave me. We've, we've received an acceptable uh, sample. They can make this um, and we're hoping to get this in, in, um, in a retail store uh, soon. But for what it's worth, I do have these that I'm uh, discounting. I think they're 125 and you get a sticker and that's that. So whoever asked, whichever shill asked me that question, thank you. <laughs> but I also sell just the, the, bush, the bushings and or a template guide kit if you don't want to buy the whole thing. And these we have in stock and there's nothing wrong with those. Good, good, good. So does anyone have any more questions? Feel free to either uh, unmute and ask or uh, type in at the Zoom chat. And now Scott, you have to wait for a few minutes. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, you guys. Uh, any idea when those uh, rudder bases are going to be in, Scott? Um, there is no. They were, we were ready to pull the trigger uh, in February, and then of course you know what happened. Uh, so everything just sort of shut down. So the new ones, we are in fact actually sending him the new one uh, this coming week uh, for them to inspect the new sample. I don't know if they're going to place the order or not. Um, we have a distributor here in the States, one in Canada, one in the UK, and one in Australia, all of which expressed interest, and we're all ready to pull the trigger. And uh, again, I'm just a mom and pop shop, so I need some sort of PO or confirmation to know that I can get these on the market. Um, so unfortunately, I don't know when, as far as the new ones, these, as I mentioned, I got about 30 left. So these are available and we sell a couple a week. So they are sort of moving and going off the shelf. But the new ones, I don't know. Obviously, when we do get them, there'll be a big announcement. Um, it will take, even when I get the purchase order, it's going to probably take 60 days for them to be processed and shipped over and redistributed. And we will be selling them also unless the distributor wants an exclusive. But I don't think that's going to happen. Um, so I, I, I don't know when, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, six months at the earliest might be my guess, but it really depends on the distributors. And we're just waiting. I think everybody's kind of waiting to see what the economy's doing. Any more so. questions? Oh, Lawrence, I'm gonna let you know that this session is free and the additional ones are gonna be $5 a person, please. And we'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to uh, purchase the order, process that order uh, through Scott's website, Imagine Woodworking. Okay, so now for the entertainment a portion of this, this is gonna be very quick. Uh, every class I wanna do a trick or a tip. So these are some things. So you take a pencil like this and you end like that, right? So it helps if you blow and you just do this without letting it go. So I start like this and I do that. So that you can all try that, that will drive you crazy. And then the tip of the day, I like to always throw in tips. If you're working in a shop and you're working with glue, uh, cleanup is always a pain. So to get an old paint, uh, get a Tupperware that has a hinge on it. Then you put a paint uh, thing in there and you can put your roller and even a, a brush. I can quickly open this up. I use this over here and I can apply glue, put it back in, close it. And the beauty is I put um, water in the bottom of underneath here. That's why I have this inside of that. And that keeps a high humid environment that won't uh, dry out your roller. And then lastly, squirt a little alcohol in your glue if you're going to let it sit for a while and it won't mold over. So that's my tip of the day on, on that one. So today you get a tip and a trick. So <laughs> hope you had fun with that. But as I said, uh, thanks everybody so much for, for watching. I've been really wanting to do this for quite some time. I hope we're going to continue with this and have you back. And uh, again, we are going to continue with this. Now we're yes, we, are. we are going to continue with this. Yes, yes, yes. So, oh, I got a clap. I never, I never did that. Um, so, thanks again for watching. Stay safe. Wear your masks. I hope you had a good Fourth of July, and hopefully, we'll see you next month. Bye, Take everybody. Care.